I see we got a little switch here on the monitor that we normally use as bigger pictures than the one I've got right now. But I think I can handle this with my glasses on. You look a little bit fuzzy though, however. <laughs> and uh, we've been looking at the passages that Jesus gave to us in Matthew 7 and talk about the fact that at the end of our life, our eternal destiny will be determined by the particular trail that uh, we walked on. There are two passages, and uh, one of them leads to life, but the other one leads to eternal damnation. And so we want to be sure that we're on the right path when we are here on this earth so that when we finish our journey, we'll find ourselves in the presence of God. And uh, the sad part of this verse, and uh, it, it is very sad to read it and realize that very few people are going to find that narrow path. But it's something that we can believe after reading the story of the flood in the Old Testament and uh, realize that only eight people were saved in the days of Noah when the flood came. And uh, I was studying with Grant in my house, remember Grant, just a couple weeks ago. And uh, remember the ambulance came up behind us over there, found out later they'd taken away one of our neighbors. He had passed away. And uh, the question always then rises, as there's a lot of advertisements on TV right now, if you die, will you go to heaven? Heaven, yes or no sort of thing. And I, I'm sure you've seen that as we have too. And uh, the question is, where will I spend eternity? Will I be with God or will I not be with God? And it is an eternal destination. It's not just a temporal destination. And so, am I going to be where I want to be or not? Let me see if I can figure out what I want to go here now. All right, there we go. So, as we're talking about the road to glory, which is what I named these sermons, there are three of them in a row. The first uh, we've already dealt with, and that is that I need to be informed. I need to be educated. I need to be taught. I need to know the word of God. I need to be an informed believer, ready to go and be with his creator. But then we also realize that uh, not only do we need to know the facts, we need to be, as believers, also convinced and ready to commit our lives to God because of what we're reading. And that would be a wise decision. And so we talked about the importance of wisdom as well. And we know that uh, we're not to live, as Jesus said, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4. And we know that the truth will set us free, according to John 8, 32. Likewise, Jesus saying that if you know the truth, you can expect to be set free, free from want, from ignorance. And uh, so we try to get into the word, study the word, know the word, believe the word, so that we can anticipate what God expects of us and be sure that we're on the right track. And then we read at the close of uh, the second letter that Peter wrote to us, chapter 3, verse 18, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are just too many people who do not know our Lord who are not familiar with him. And we're told that eternal life is to know the Father and to know his Son, John 17, verse 3. So as we dig into the Word and go passage by passage, sometimes committing them to memory, Psalm 119, verse 11, as we look at, the, as we look at these contexts and read these promises of God and also the warnings of God, we realize that we need to be a well-informed body of people. We need to be intelligent. But as I mentioned in that first sermon, you can have the knowledge that's on Wikipedia and beyond. You could be an Encyclopedia Britannica 
and still not have a relationship with God, still not be certain of your eternal destination. So being informed, being taught, knowing the truth is very important. But then you also have to be kind of smart. And that's what we just read about just a moment ago. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus said, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. When I built my house down in Venezuela, I was a little alarmed to find out that there were probably somewhere around 400 to 500 feet of sand under my house. <laughs> I read the Bible enough to know that the wise man built his house on a rock and the foolish man built his house on the sand. And the reason is because when the floods come, the house built on sand will collapse. The house built on the rock will survive. It's got a firm foundation. And there's a magazine in our brotherhood called The Firm Foundation. And we want to build our lives on something that's like that. So when I asked the architect about my house, he said, oh, that's true. What the Bible says is true. If you build your house on sand, it will fall if there's a flood. But the difference is we're going to make sure no water ever gets near the foundation of your house. And on both sides, I've got a cover. I've got concrete on both sides. It's just taking all the way out of touch of my house. And my house is safe and it's been there for many, many years. But a foolish man built his house right on the sand and not dig deep, not have any protection against the floods. And when the floods come, the house will fall. And so we want to be the kind of people, Jesus says, that are wise. But what we have to do to be wise, according to this context, it says that we have to know his word. There's that information again, the intelligence aspect. But then after that, we also need to be sure that we're wise and put those words into practice. Not just believe that they're true, but actually act upon them and do what God has asked us to do. So we read in John 3, 5 that Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed to be born again. In verse 3 and in verse 5, he says, Verily I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Talking about baptism, what the court just shared with us, the death of burial, the resurrection. We need to reenact dramatically the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus when we're ready to be saved. But we want salvation because that's what God requires of us. His son did that for us, and we, in turn, go through this burial in water, not earth, but a burial in water that represents that, and then that reminds us of the sacrifice that was paid for our salvation and the means by which we're going to have hope. Because when we are baptized, we're told in Romans 6, 4, which court read for us, we can expect to have a new life. Uh, the old man is gone. He's buried. He's crucified, the Bible says. And now we depend on a resurrection from that watery grave that's going to give us a whole new life. But you realize that that means there's going to be a change. If you're going to have a new life, it needs to be different from the old life, and it needs to be better than the old life. And that's what baptism's about. It's like I've come to the moment when I'm ready to be born again, start all over. And that's what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. As you are, you, you just can't make it. You're going to have to start all over again. So you're going to be reborn. And then when we are reborn, we start a new life. And so that gives us an opportunity to get on the path that leads, that narrow path that leads to heaven where God will wait for us. And then in Luke 13 and verse 3, we're told by Jesus, unless we repent, we're all going to perish. Well, repentance is also a turning around, a going back, a doing better. And uh, so when we're on the broad way, what do we need to do? Tell me, we need to get off of it and we need to make a decision that now we're going to travel down that narrow path that leads to eternal life. And then Jesus, 
tells us in Matthew 18, verse 3, something that's very beautiful about our conversion and our new life. The one who's been crucified and resurrected to walk with Jesus is that we're going to be like little children. Well, that's what you are when you're born again. You become a little child. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. We have to change. And what a change. When you die and are reborn, when you crucify the old self and resurrect a new person, and when you turn around and get off of that Broadway that leads to eternal destruction <clears throat> and begin to travel on that narrow path that leads to life eternal, that's a major change. That's the biggest change you'll ever make in your life. But it also points to something else that is really important. And that is that, uh, like Jesus said, the wise man will build his house on the rock. The foolish man built his house on sand. And uh, we need to be sure that we're on a solid foundation when we make our final decision as to which path we're going to follow and where we hope to spend eternity. Very important. Yeah. You're one slide behind. On the screen, I think. Really? Okay. Sorry about that. Maybe I should watch the screen. <laughs> All right. Give me a give me a clue. Uh, if I'm getting off of it again. Okay. I'm sorry. I hope you were able to follow. Were you able to follow that in spite of me being on the wrong slide? Yeah. Talk about foolish people and wise people and informed people and not informed people. <clears throat> Probably I need a change. Okay, so who do we want to be as we're trying to walk down the right path? We want to be those who know enough, who are wise enough, but also who are obedient enough. Because, you know, talking about the wise man, he built his house. He did something. He proceeded to do the right thing. And even those who repent are the ones who have made their minds up, I'm going to live the right kind of life now, not fool myself or deceive myself. And so one of the best examples we have of that is found in Luke 2.40, where a young child named Jesus grew and became strong. He was filled with what? Wisdom. Wisdom. And the grace of God was on him. And that also helps me understand why you didn't answer my question. Because you weren't even looking at this same frame I was looking at. That's interesting. But uh, we want to be sure that we're on the right track. And then when our neighbors see an ambulance pull up front of our house, we'll know we're headed in the right direction. And that we're going to be seeing God immediately. And that's our hope. And Jesus came and he was not just well informed, but he was one of those wise ones who not only understood what the his life and sings for hours is just too much to comprehend. But then to imagine Jesus being a child, an infant even, but having to live a life like we've lived and experience what we're experiencing and also showing us how to walk on that narrow path that leads us to eternity. And uh, one of the verses that I love in the scriptures, got the right one this time, is through 2.51. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. When he came back from his sojourn in Egypt, where he was hiding from Herod and his parents as well, when he came back, he worked with his father. He was the son of the carpenter, Joseph. And I can imagine how many times he cut his finger. I can imagine how many times he smashed his finger. And uh, we know that he, he went through a learning experience there, but he was obedient to his parents. I mean, how often would you anticipate that somebody would say to God, 
Go back in there and wash your hands. But can't you imagine that maybe his mother Mary said that sometime in his life? Don't forget to clean up the shop when you're finished, Joseph may have told him. And guess what Jesus did? Tell me. Oh. He did what he was told to do. He cleaned up the shop. He washed his hands. And being the creator of the universe, the one who gave origin to the human race, and therefore, to, you know, these two parents that he had, it had to be hard to be obedient when they owed obedience to him in the first place. But he did, because he was here not only to save us, but to set an example for us. And he did. And so as we're thinking about staying on that narrow path that leads to life eternal, as we're thinking about being well informed, we know we've got to read the word. We've got to dig into the Bible. We've got to memorize those scriptures. We got to meditate on them day and night, according to Psalm chapter one, verse five. I mean, verse two, excuse me. And we need to be the kind of people that love his word, that enjoy reading it, studying it, memorizing it, teaching it to others. And we need to be wise enough to do, as Jesus said, what I'm telling you to do by means of these words, this message. There's something you need to do and you need to be sure you get it done. So we're, we're, we're obligated to be obedient to him, but he because he wanted to save us, came to this world, became a human being, lived a very degrading form of life compared to what he had had in the glory of heaven, and then to die for us that we might be saved. And that's what the whole world is thinking about today as they think about Easter. But you know, in uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 9, we read this, I think, is a good summary what we're talking about. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, days, he was eternal. He had always existed. He created this universe. He created this earth. But during the days that he was spending time here on the earth, what a lot. He offered up prayers. He prayed. He talked to the Father. He wasn't in the immediate presence, physically speaking, of the Father. He was now a physical creature. He was living on this earth. He was a human being. He was mortal. He could die. He was going to die. He had to die. And so he took on flesh and blood and was willing to age as he went from infancy to childhood to manhood. And uh, he prayed. He talked to the Father like we do. Same thing we do all day long, and uh, he, he offered up prayers and petitions, and that's what we do. We go to God when we want something, not just when we want to communicate with him, but when we need his help, petitions, and Jesus offered up petitions with fervent cries. Oh, Father, and it wasn't just hi, no, it was fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. He knew he was going to die. He was mortal now. But death is frightening, isn't it? He said, well, I know somebody that died in sleep. He seemed very comfortable. All of us at times thinking about that we're only going to be here so many years. And then we're going to leave. And we know that there's only two paths that lead out of this world. One leads you into eternal death damnation and it will lead you into eternal life. But you have to be concerned about where you're going to spend eternity. What's going to happen to you after you close your eyes for the last time and take your last breath? And it says that he offered a fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. He had to think about his death too. Being who he was, knowing what he knew, he understood he was going to be crucified. He knew what it was to be flogged and to be crucified because that was a common thing in the Roman Empire. And so he knew that he was going to go through unbelievable pain, terrible torture, and that he was going to die on a Roman cross. He knew that. And it was scary. And so he prayed and offered up 
fervent petitions to the Father. And the Bible says that when he prayed with tears streaming down his cheek, tears to the one who could save him from death, he was heard because of his what? Reverent submission. What does reverent submission mean? We know we're to have reverence for God. We're to respect God. We are not gods. We're human beings, frail, helpless, and in need of God's assistance always. And so we need to be humble when we go into the presence of God. We need to recognize our limitations. And we need to realize his glory. Remember how magnificent he is and that he is an eternal being and that life and death are in his hands. And so when you think about Jesus going before the Father, crying and shouting out to him, for fear of the death he was going to have to die. And it says that he had reverent submission to the Father. It means that respecting God for who he was as the Father, he went to him as his son who had come to this world and taken on flesh and blood. And humbly, humbly, trembling, anticipating what was coming, asked for God to help him and even to deliver him from death, if it were possible, there was some way to maybe change our plans. Maybe we ought to. But at the same time, willing to be obedient. If he could obey Mary, if he could obey Joseph, if he could obey all of the mundane orders that are received at home, then certainly he could obey the creator of the universe, his own father with the midst of eternity himself to whom he had worked and rejoiced. If he, if he being who he was could then go up before the presence of God and humbly ask for deliverance, even from death itself maybe. He said, it says that he did it in reverent submission. Who am I to not submit to God? Jesus did. But that's what we are taught by Jesus' example, that we should reverently submit and obey. So we need to be informed. We need to be wise with the information that we have and see that we respond correctly to it. But then we also be the kind of people who come before God in obedience. If you want to be on that trail, that track, that path, that road that leads to eternal life in heaven, then you've got to have those three, three things. You're going to have to read the Bible if you don't like to read much. You're going to have to study and get to know what God has said. Listen to the word of God. Know it. Believe it. Respond to it positively because you're wise. And then being wise, you need to do what God has asked you to do. Because that's one of the key factors of wisdom is obedience when we're talking about God. Son, though he was, he learned what? Obedience. From what he suffered. All that he had to go through in life was a matter of submission. All he went through in life was a matter of obedience to the Father, doing the will of the Father, not his own will. And so... Uh, he says in John 8, 29, go there now. Father, I mean, excuse me. The one who sent me is with me, he says to the crowd. He has not left me alone, for I will always do what pleases him. He always did what pleased the Father. Well, that's an act of submission. That's an act of uh, reverent submission. It's an act of obedience. So he knew the message. He wrote it. He knew the message. He revealed it to the prophets of old and the apostles. He knew the word. That was part of him. He was even called the word when he came to this world. And that was the reference that John the apostle used to describe the word. And so he was informed, definitely ready to respond to that message. But then he also was wise enough to be obedient to that word 
and do what the Father wanted him to do. Always. Always do what pleases him. And then Luke 22, 42. He prays a really serious prayer when he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. I imagine this prayer was something similar to what he prayed all his life as he thought about what he was going to have to endure at the end. But he had to certainly done it with all of the feeling that he could muster and all the sincerity of his heart when he said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup, talking about his death on the cross. If you can take, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Not what I want, but what you want. Let that be the final determination. What do you want, Father? That's what I want to. I want to do whatever you ask me to do. And so he gave his life because he was reverently submissive. He was an obedient son. He knew the hope of the whole humanity that we represent had to be saved from sin and saved from death and saved from eternal damnation. So he paid the price. What he feared the most, he experienced on the cross. In Luke 23, 44 through 46, we read, It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Can you imagine if you were there, and it was a bright, sunset and night day, and all of a sudden, everything just became night. The sun quit shining. Doom seemed to fall on him. But the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple, the temple of God in Jerusalem, was torn in two. Why? Well, you've seen people tear up pieces of paper that they don't want anymore. And uh, God was disturbed. He stayed in the most holy place in the temple. That's where his presence was always found with the priest. And so the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place, God, as he saw his son dying on the cross, ripped that curtain into two pieces and it ripped from the top to the bottom, not from the bottom up. It wasn't done by human hands. It was done by divine hands. It started at the top and came down. Oh, the curtain of the temple was torn in. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. I can imagine the value of the last breath of Jesus on earth. He had breathed a lot. We breathed a lot. I don't know how many times you've breathed while you've been in this room this morning, but you have had a lot of breaths. But that was his last breath. He died for me. He died for you. And the Father had to endure that. And then those that were there who saw what happened were impressed like never before. Luke 23, 47 to 48 says, the centurion, the Roman soldier responsible for the other soldiers that were there, who actually nailed into that cross, raised that cross up, and then stayed there gambling for his garments until the end had come. The centurion seeing what had happened, seeing the sun quit shining, and there was also, we're told in the other Gospels, an earthquake. The earth trembled beneath them. And then Jesus takes his last breath, makes his last utterances from the cross. The centurion, seeing what happened, praised God. Can you imagine that? A Roman centurion who just crucified the Savior praised God and said, Surely, this was a righteous man. Why else would the sun stop shining at the time of his death? Why else would there be an earthquake? Why else would the temple be shaking to the point that the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place be ripped into? Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts. He wasn't the centurion, wasn't the only one who noted what was going on or heard the proclamations of Jesus from the cross. No. The 
people that were there just watching also did. Some were believers, not many. Others weren't. They were just spectators, I'm sure. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. They went away just beating their breasts. They realized a horrible thing had just happened. The death of God on the cross. The death of the Son of God at Calvary. And we then read about the resurrection, which we were talking about earlier as we took the Lord's Supper. Luke 24, verse 5. When some of the women who loved Jesus came to embalm his body and brought spices, they, they got there and the tomb where they had placed Jesus was open. There had been a huge rock placed there, a stone, but it had been rolled back by an angel. And now, he wasn't in there any longer. And when they got there, angelic messengers responded. I know our ladies been studying about angels, and you probably remember reading some of this. But the men who were there, dressed in white, radiant clothes, shining like the sun, who were angelic beings, messengers from God, said to these women, why do you look for the living among the dead? What are you looking for here? Somebody that's Dead? I mean, while he's alive, he is risen. He is not here. <laughs> you didn't need to come. There's no body that you can anoint. It's over. It's over. The resurrection took place three days later. And Jesus, as he had promised over and over again and told his disciples, was resurrected from the dead and once again lived. And we read in Hebrews 2, kind of a later summation of what took place and the importance of it. Chapter 2, verse 14 through 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. In other words, we might stand in, in front of fear, I mean, in front of death and just be shaking with fear, but Jesus came to die on the cross to liberate us from our sins, forgive us of our sins, and to take away the fear that the devil had placed there of us having to just die and rot. And the living Jesus is the answer. Now, Another summation, even more summary, is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 56 through 57. The sting of death is sin. In other words, what's the real power? Of, uh, this thing we call death is sin. The sting of death is sin. Sin causes people to die. It causes people to go into that state known as death. But the power of sin is the law. Oh, the law gave us the stone that we were stumbled over. It gave us the trap into which we failed. And then we served the devil's purposes and did what he wanted us to do. And became guilty of sin and therefore worthy of death and condemned to die. And Jesus came to give us victory over that. But thanks be to God, in spite of the law not being able to save us and actually serving to trip us up. And then in spite of the fact that we voluntarily broke the law of God and sinned and are worthy of death, in spite of all of that, we have a victory in Jesus. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why all around the world today, people that never think of Jesus, never talk about Jesus, don't serve Jesus, they're not informed, they're not wise, and neither are they obedient. Today, we're talking a lot about Jesus. And they do it once a year. They ought to do it every Sunday, when we, like we do, thinking of the Lord's Supper. They ought to do it every day when they thank God for his son, the salvation that we have through him every day. But they don't. But at least once a year, they stop to think about how we've been delivered from sin and death by Jesus 
And to do that, he had become a human being, a mortal. And he had to die. And he did, willingly. There's a song that we don't know here as a congregation, I don't think. But I love it. And it's an old song. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. Talking about what we were talking about with my house. There's only one way, the narrow way that leads to heaven. I must needs go home by the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. By the way of the cross, there's no other way but this. I shall never get sight of the gates of life. If the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. We're informed. I hope we're wise. I trust we'll all be obedient. If you've not been born again, again, of water and the spirit, if you've not become a Christian, you've not been crucified with Christ. I thought these are the verses we read earlier. If you've never repented and changed your life, if you've never become humble and obedient like a child, if you need to do that, I beg you, make this Easter a special Easter for you. And give your life to Jesus. Change. And if you need to repent of something you've done that's gotten you off the track, off the path that leads to glory, then get back on it. Change and do the will of God and learn from Jesus who was reverently submissive to the will of his Father. You can do the same. He set the example for you. And the way of the cross leads home. There's no other way to get there. Brother Bill, would you come with some closing remarks and tell us how we can do more than stay in the way and get on the way and do what Jesus wants us to do? Thank you, Bob. I was actually shaking, sitting back there, wondering if I was going to do the wrong thing and tell you about those silly slides. Um, <laughs> No, thank you. I appreciate that. I would have gone through the whole thing with the wrong slide. Well, anyway, thank you for the message. And um, you know, uh, it's it's quite a time of year, and I I don't know what your personal experience is, but for me, the resurrection of Jesus is the whole story. Uh, with that, uh, lives change, and so. Um, uh, Hope that uh, the message has really hit all of us this morning. We do have a number of announcements. Um, won't be any Bible studies tonight. We'll be having family time. I'm sure a lot of you have plans for Easter, for lunch, or late dinner, whatever it might be. So enjoy all of that. Uh, we'll have, looks like women are up for their class uh, next Sunday evening. Uh, I want to thank Teresa for getting everything organized for Eagle Academy and everybody that helped out with that last week. And so that was a good thing, a wonderful thing to be able to do again. And then um, we will have our ongoing Bible studies this week, as Court was good to mention. Uh, we've been having a great study on Wednesdays uh, in Romans. And so that continues, and ladies, the Thursday study as well. And then we have uh, some new items on our prayer list, so be sure you grab a bulletin if you haven't done that uh, yet. Um, you'll see Juwan in the back, and he's looking pretty good. Uh, so we're thankful for all that and the surgery that he had. And seems to be going better, and you'll notice also that Fabrizio is doing well, and Janice are doing well. And uh, two things there at the bottom that really cheered my spirits, uh, but baby Annika's up to eight pounds. How wonderful is that? And also, you know, we have been paying praying for Mike Castor for a long, long time. And so to see that he's cancer free now is fabulous. I want to mention Barry's brother, Ted, in Atlanta uh, with uh, blood clots in his brain. Barry, is there anything else more current we should mention? Um, no, he has something called a bilateral hematoma. <clears throat> Appreciate your 
So those of you on the Zoom, Barry was just uh, expressing that the situation for his brother is critical and we do want to be praying uh, for Ted. So also continue to pray for Sophia's dad, you know, who has a lot of experience in the restaurant industry. He's still looking for a job. So we want to pray for him, for our daughter, Patricia and my daughter, Amy, that she's having somewhat of a struggle in Florida. So I appreciate your prayers there. And then another new item, Janice Paul, whom a lot of you remember, um, uh, she's got a young friend here, a mother who's got cancer. Um, so Jessica, we want to be praying for her. And then uh, uh, Amanda, um, your dad, he's had all his treatments now, is that right? So, and uh, is this the more difficult time where he's? He seems to be doing good. 